Does active share actually lead to outperformance? We're going to research a uh, Vanguard study. We're going to look at a Vanguard study or article they just published the other day about active share in terms of uh, can it <laughs> give you a way to beat the market? So let's dive right into this, my friends, at the Heritage Wealth Planning YouTube channel. So as always, if you like what you see here, subscribe and give me comments and thumbs up for sure. All right. Uh, so you may or may not know what active share means. A few years ago, there's a guy at Yale, I think, and I, I think he was a lecturer. I'm not sure if he's a full-fledged uh, prof. I liked his article, actually. Two guys. Oh, man, I forget. I, I don't know how to pronounce their names, but I, I've held on to it for many years because I liked it. And he talked about these two guys at uh, Creamers, C-R-E-M-E-R-S, Creamers at a Yale. And I think he's since moved on. Uh, Creamers is his name. I forgot the other guy who wrote it. But anyway, long story short, I uh, had written this article, Active Share, and that if you have an active share portfolio, you can outperform the market. And, and, and that just took the industry by storm because everyone says, oh, finally, a way to justify our high fees that we're charging for investment management. So let me explain what active share is first and foremost, and then we can dive into why that uh, may, may not be something you should be looking at. So if you take the S&P 500, you have 500 shares, you have 500 stocks in the S&P 500. If you have 50 shares in your portfolio, all right, so the S&P 500 is 500 shares, you or stocks, you got 50, which means you only have 10% of the entirety of the S&P 500. Thus, what you do is you take one minus that 10% and you get a 90% active share. It's kind of counterintuitive, but again, if S&P 500 is 500 stocks, you got 550 stocks, which means you only represent 10% of the S&P 500. You, uh, that's 0.1, so you take one, which is 100% of the 500, minus your position that you have relative to the S&P 500 and you have an active share of 90%. The higher the active share would go is that the more likely you are to outperform. And I absolutely agree with that. I mean, it inherently makes sense. What these guys are saying more that I think that got overlooked by a lot of the uh, the investment managers want to charge a high fee is they're saying if you have 500 shares in the S&P 500 and you are running an active mutual fund with 450 shares, all right, uh, the stocks, I mean, so S&P 500 is 500 stocks. You got 450. Well, in this case, you have a total active share of 10%. And what we say is that is a closet index fund because you're basically just towing the line on the index. And if you're charging active management uh, percentage expenses for a closet index, uh, there's no way you're going to beat the market. And you'll do uh, significantly lower than the market because you're you're just towing the line of the market, but you're charging you know, sometimes 25 times what the market's charging. And I go back to a, a fund I saw in this guy's 401k, which was an index fund charging 55 basis points or 0.55%. And there's, I mean, every year that's going to underperform the market by 0.55%. There's no getting around that because that's that's what it is. And that's a pretty high cost index fund for sure. So the issue here is if you are a closet, what these guys, Creamers and the other guy were talking about, I was like, look, the worst kind of investment is a closet index fund, one with a low active share, because simply you're going to tag the market, but you're going to do so minus your fee, which again would be on, we'll just say 1%. And that's silly. In fact, what these guys would say is, in fact, most people would say those investment managers who are doing that as a closet indexer are just essentially taking money. And there's no other way around that uh, simply because they're not adding any value whatsoever, but yet you're, they're developing fees as if they were. So what they say is, look, if you have an active share, you have a chance to outperform. In fact, they did some studies that said a lot of active shares funds do outperform. And I mean, it inherently makes sense. I mean, think about it. If I have one stock, all right, and the S and P five hundred has five hundred stocks. I have one stock, so my active share is over ninety nine percent. If that one stock kicks butt and takes names, I'm going to beat the market absolutely, and I'll be looking great. If I have one stock and it goes bankrupt, I'll underperform the market. And so then we're just talking speculation. We're not talking investment pure and say. I mean, you might be investing if you know the company back and forth and you like it and you're down for the long ride. But generally speaking, if you want to outperform the market, you need to reduce the number of shares that you the number of stocks that you have, i.e., have a higher active share, because some stocks will outperform, some stocks will underperform. That, that's just the way it works. Uh, but the idea that the active share in 
as a whole will lead you to outperform. And it's just silly. I mean, we just don't know. If you have all gold stocks, for instance, in 2011, uh, you have a high active share, but you just got hammered. You got killed relative to the market, even though you had a high active share, because in that case, it's all about where your assets are in terms of your diversification. Your lack of diversification in an underperforming area is going to lead you down into the sewer of investment returns. On the other hand, your lack of diversification in another overperforming area will lead you to higher returns so without question. So that's the issue with active share. All right. So along comes a Vanguard study, or I guess research on this, which I find it pretty interesting uh, because, again, the, the active share, it makes sense that, again, the lower the, the correlation, the lower the diversification, if you are on the lucky side where your portfolio does well, you will beat the market. There's just no other way around that. Um, but let's talk about what Vanguard says. Myth. Higher active share leads to better outcomes. And I think even Morningstar bought into the active share thing, hook, line, and sinker, probably going back to 2011 or 12, uh, when they actually started publishing active share percentages. And I, I look, I, I don't have a problem with that. Again, it's a way not to say these funds are going to beat the market, but more as a way to say these funds are closet indexers, and I want to stay away from them. No reason to be in a closet index fund uh, when you can just buy the straight index and have save a heck of a lot of fees. Our reality is that the senior, the zero sum game and the low cost advantage apply no matter the percentage of a fund that portfolio that differs from the benchmark index. And that's actually what even um, the, uh, the creamers and the other guys said, uh, without question, the number one thing when it comes to investing is your lowest cost, the lower cost ones. If you want a way to outperform in the future, reduce your expenses. And that is your number one way that you can potentially outperform. Active share is a measure of how different a fund is from its benchmark. We talked about that. Uh, the thing is that these managers with a high active share are truly active and are more likely to outperform because they should have higher skill set and their ability to pick stocks and avoid the bad ones. Uh, the extra performance, the reasoning go, will make their higher fees worth it. Exactly. Meanwhile, active managers have long suspected of being closet indexers, which means that their funds closely resemble the benchmarks they use to measure themselves against. Uh, but hugging the index raises the question, why pay more for active market, active management, when you can just buy an index fund? And that's without question. Uh, does active share actually work? A lot of people would like you to believe that the higher active share leads to greater outperformance versus the benchmark. The data, however, do not bear this out. Being different from the market does not get active managers better returns. It gets them different returns for better or for worse. We could not agree with that more. The chart below shows that as active share increases, the range of excess returns increases as well. Expense ratio has a notable effect on this range. I cannot agree with that more. As expenses increase, the greater proportion of excess returns fall below zero. But what you see as the cone widens, and then after costs are taken into consideration, fund performances move below those of their benchmark. So what you see here is the more the active share, the higher the active share, and this is 90%. So again, if you have a 90% active share, if the S&P 500 has 500 stocks, you only have 50 stocks. And what you can see is a greater divergence in terms of the, the return. So we, here we got negative, what's that, 15 or so, and here we got a positive five. Uh, and so you see the excess returns as it gets law as you get more and more active, removed from the benchmark, you get more and more excess returns. Again, the benchmark is just zero, saying that's what not that the benchmark gave you a zero percent rate of return, but the benchmark return was X. Did you get X above or X minus? And that's what we're showing here. The higher the active share, the more variance the returns for sure. But then you factor in fees and you'll see the bulk is down on this side below that that uh, small little gray line there because when you factor in fees it's almost impossible not impossible it's, it's very 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 hard for a fund manager net of fees to outperform the index um now some will for sure but especially even if they have high active share it's just i mean some do the question is do you know who those people who will in advance and the answer is no all right so notes we screen the universe of actually managed U.S. funds uh, to identify those with inception dates. Okay, so we, uh, we, we, you can read all that if you want. Why active share doesn't work. To understand why this myth does not hold up under scrutiny, let's for, first remember that all investing is a zero-sum game, meaning that in the aggregate, the aggregate, the outperformance by some dollars of investment must equal the underperformance by others. I actually don't like saying investing is a zero-sum game. I, I don't believe that. I think speculating is a zero-sum game. Speculating is gambling. If I win, you have to lose. There's just no getting around that. Investing, though, is not a zero-sum game. We can all win in investing. 
excess returns, um, not excess returns, but increasing growth of earnings, increasing dividend yields, increasing stock buybacks, a growing economy. We can all win in investing. And then inherently it's not zero sum, but it's speculating is zero sum. Across any market, there's a range of returns. Some investors and active managers will do better than the others. And results tend to follow a bell curve with investors' returns grouped around the market return, which is the average of all investment dollars. For some investors to attain a greater return than the market return, others must receive less. I completely agree with that. An active manager who tilts a portfolio to be dramatically different from the market benchmark might find incredible success or failure. The manager may discover a portfolio positioning that had little overall effect. We just don't know. But then there is a cost that, into investing that, as a matter of simple math, math must detract from investors' net returns. Hence, the bell curve will shift to the left. And this is what Bogle, John Bogle from Vanguard, has been arguing since the 1970s. And I think when he did his first paper in 1955 or something like that. Uh, the, 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 hence, the bell curve will shift to the left, as we see here. Here's the market benchmark. Here's the bell curve, the distribution of investor returns. The benchmark is right smack dab in the middle. You get 50% on the high end, 50% on the low end. But after you factor fees, here is the benchmark return, but net of fees, that's the benchmark return right there. Essentially, what happens is these people are the only ones who beat the, the market after fees are considered. So you have 50% beating the market, 50% below the market. After fees, though, the, the, uh, the benchmark return, net of fees goes over here. Not the benchmark, but the essentially the average. And these are the only people right there who, who won, which is uh, you know, about 25% of the population. Now, again, can you identify those 25% in advance? No, you can't. Did you know Peter Lynch was going to be Peter Lynch? No, you didn't. People say, what about Warren Buffett? Are Warren Buffett's best days behind us or in front of us? We don't know. We know he's done great in the past. Is that worth taking a gamble on? Probably. But do you know that Warren Buffett will outperform in the future? We have no idea. Uh, so that's that's the issue. Is this is what happens right there. This is the best chart there is. After you factor the cost, the vast majority are going to underperform the benchmark regardless of active share. All right. The greater the cost, the greater the hurdle. Active managers who charge a lot might, may discover that they have to take greater risk to justify their fees. Yep. Uh, note that in particular, the red and the orange dots in the first chart, which represents uh, funds with expense ratios in the highest 40 percent of all active U.S. MEC equity funds. Active share can be useful as a to verify that a fund actually takes a bet it claims it takes. Uh, by itself, active share may indicate only variation of performance. High active share may also lead to higher turnover and thus higher costs, more trading, which is a filter that's correlated with war lower performance. Uh, a qualitative judgment regarding the health of the investment manager and a depth of an analytical team is needed to evaluate active funds. Uh, what I'd say is active share can actually be wonderful to see who's a cause of index. Right? I mean, if you have a low active share and you're charging 1% 1 1 fee, run for the hills. Percentage of actively managed equity funds that beat their benchmarks uh, from peers ending 2016. So we got 25 uh, years in 2016. 42% uh, of the least expensive quartile. All right. So that beat 42% uh, in the least expensive beat them. And then only 24% in the most expensive, uh, which beat their uh, peers. So again, uh, beat their performance. So only 42% of the active managed funds that had the lowest expenses even beat the benchmark. I mean, that's pretty going to be, I mean, so again, we're talking about the funds that actually beat the benchmark, not just the fund universe as a whole. Only 42% did of the funds with the least expensive. So there you go. I, I'm a big fan of that. I love the work that Vanguard does. You should too. You should read it. Just remember, don't get caught up in my fund as high active share. Thus, I'm going to outperform. They're just, we don't know that for sure. You don't know that for sure. I don't know it for sure. If it's a closet indexer, we know for sure that it will underperform without question. As always, you like what you see here, subscribe. Don't forget to let me know if this is uh, helpful. Comments, questions, thoughts, always helpful. And go to blog at heritagewealthplanning.com. And we'll see you next.